what I want to talk about a little bit today is the negative impact that bad debt makes on a company's future sale. And I know it seems kind of strange that bad debt can actually affect a company's future sales. But if you think about it, a company actually has to realize new sales to offset any bad debts that they have if they do not collect those bad debts. Um, and the way, the way we look at that is not just the amount that's owed to them, but also what is their profit margin, okay? So profit margins are gonna play a pretty large role in how much a bad debt costs somebody. Um, a lot of times when you're dealing with a potential client, they're going to ask, how much is it going to cost me to collect our money? And, well, it's going to cost them a percentage based on whatever the aging of the debt is at the time of placement. But the fact is, how much is it costing them now? Uncollected revenue has to be offset with new sales. Okay, so if they have a small balance debt there that's a thousand dollars, it's not only costing them that thousand dollars, it's costing them whatever amount of sales it takes that company to make that thousand dollars back. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys a, uh, a graph here. And this, this is a graph that I put together on what it costs a company to offset bad debt. And if you look at the smallest amount there, that $500 debt, if that company's net profit, and when I say net, I mean net after, after every bit of overhead, after salaries are paid, after taxes are paid, every every bit of debt. Okay. Most most larger companies are going to fall between two percent and six percent net profit. Okay, and what that means is let's say there's a five hundred dollar debt there. A company actually has to sell another $10,000 worth of whatever their product is, if they have a 5% net profit, to recover that loss. Okay, um, if, if you look on the other side of this graph, you'll see where a, a $2,500 debt can cost a company as much as $125,000 to keep on the books. That's based on a 2% net profit. So something we want to look at when, when we're discussing a client's or a potential client's bad debts, you know, what, what is it costing them to keep that money on the books to to hope and pray that one day that this company is going to pay them. What is it costing them? Well, if they're doing a 2% net profit, $2,500 in debt is going to cost them $125,000 in additional sales just to offset that loss. That's, that's before before anything else, just to offset that loss. A lot of the, the accounts receivable managers and credit managers that we deal with these days, 
don't fully understand these numbers at this level. And it's important because they're taking their profits into the toilet by holding on to bad debt. So if they place the accounts and we collect them, the percentage that we charge them to collect it is nominal compared to what they could actually what they could actually lose like this. One of one of the things I was talking to Rick about, uh, this was maybe maybe a month ago. Rick and I were talking um, about a trucking guy. He had about eight thousand dollars sitting there that was owed to him by a broker and it was over a year old so we were going to charge him either 40 or or 50 percent to collect it and we may have we may have negotiated that down a little bit if he were to place some newer accounts with it but the fact of the matter is once you wait that long it costs more money to collect it but what what this guy didn't realize is what that was costing him because let's think about a trucking carrier a trucking carrier not only has the expenses of his time or his employees time to drive the truck from point A to point B to bring the load but he has maintenance on that truck he has fuel he has insurance and of course the cost of the truck and I, I don't I don't know if any of you have ever priced a semi, but they are not cheap. <laughs> and you know, this is this is something that that companies should should realize when we're approaching them to take on their debt for us to collect it. Um, do, do I have any questions? As of yet, on off, on offsetting offsetting a uh, bad debt loss. Is everybody's microphones working? Yes, sir. <laughs> all right, all right. So we're good on this. Um, also, also something we can look at is the negative impact that bad debt makes on net profit. For example, most of us have talked to a few credit managers that say, hey, I collect 99.9% .9 of everything. And, and just so you know, a company that does a billion a year, 99.9% .9 of everything still leaves a million bucks on the tape. Okay. Now, if you're dealing with a company that collects 99.9% .9 of their AR, which typically those are going to be larger companies that operate around a 2% net profit, That means that they're giving up 5% of their profits. Now, if they only collect 99.5% of their receivables at a 2% net, that's one-fourth of their net profit. And that's one of the reasons why collecting 99% of your accounts receivable, it's not enough. You know, if, if you're a company that operates at 2% and you collect 99% of everything, you've, get, you've given away half of your profits at 99%. Can you explain that one more time? Okay. For, for a company that, that collects 99%, well, 99.9%, of their accounts receivable and operates at a 2% net profit margin, which this is going to be your larger companies. Okay, your larger companies are going to have 
higher percentages of collections because they're pretty good at running a tight ship, but they're going to have a smaller net profit margin. Okay, and if they collect 99.9% .9 at a 2% net profit, 5% of their total profit is lost on bad down. 5%. If they're collecting 99.5, 99.5 on a 2% net profit, that's 25% of their net profit. And I also have I have a, a write up about this that I put on our blog um, a couple of months ago, and there's there's also a uh, a flyer on it um, called profit loss bad debt and sales. Um, Can you use the example of the hundred thousand dollars, five million dollars in additional sales to uh, recoup? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And and the point is, um, when when we're looking back at additional actual additional sales required to offset bad de bad debt, we can look at this graph right here, and it's going to show you that at a at at just a, a five percent net profit. $500, if we look all the way to the left on that graph, is going to cost them 10000 in additional sales. Okay, and as, as you go down in the profit margins, of course, it gets higher than that. If you look to the far right-hand side of the spectrum on this example, and we're using small balance debt here for examples. So this $2,500 debt that's listed here, is going to cost a company that does a 2% net $125,000 in additional sales. Okay? And that's, that's something you want to look at when, when you're offering our services to potential clients. You know, because if they don't know how much the bad debt is costing them, they may be less willing to place that account for collections. Um, and, and additionally, we're not we're not giving this information out to scare clients. We're giving it to them because they need it. Once a company starts getting into two percent uncollected and three percent uncollected on their receivables, it could actually financially cripple a company and force them out of business. Because when you're when you're not realizing the profits you should, you don't have that money to spend. You don't have it to spend on equipment. You don't have it to spend on on whatever supplies that that your company gets to offer its product. You know, there's several parameters there that could cause a company financial trouble just from not collecting their money. So it's, it's very important for a credit manager or an accounts receivable manager to maintain a positive cash flow and keep an ODSO, which is day sales outstanding, uh, meaning if their average is 45 days that they're waiting to to get paid and they're billing net 30 that means they're they're doing okay you know because some of those are going to be late some of them are going to be on time but once your DSO starts getting closer to 60 you know you're you're in trouble because that's that's the company's cash flow it's what it uses to operate and without cash flow, a company cannot operate. So it's very important for a company to have an effective third-party firm in place to handle the collection efforts within a reasonable time frame. Because if, if they're not collecting the money, it could cause them financial troubles. Now, 
you're also going to talk to companies that are within their acceptable loss limits. Now, if they're within their acceptable loss limits, that's good for them. But they can still collect more of that money. A lot of a lot of companies that will use in-house collection departments will tell you, oh, we do everything in-house, we're within our acceptable loss, so we're fine. Well, then the question becomes, well, what could you do with the extra money that's collected? You know, let's say you do a billion dollars in sales annually. Your acceptable loss is a tenth of a percent, which is a million dollars in that example. If we can collect half of that money for them, what can they do with an extra half a million in, in budget for additional marketing <coughs> campaigns to obtain new customers or maybe for research and development? to discover products that they can market to existing customers. There's so many things a company can do with additional revenue that a lot of times is just sitting right there in their receivables waiting to be collected. They could give their, uh, their executives more bonuses. <laughs> <laughs> Or, or they could give the people who do the work more bonuses. Either way. I don't see that happen. But. <laughs> well, that, that's going to be more attractive to a credit manager. And right. additionally, if your credit manager is within this acceptable loss and then hires a collection agency and collects even more of that and brings it way above their acceptable loss, well, when that credit manager has his or her review, that credit manager can go in and say, hey, this is why I deserve a raise. Look what I did with the accounts receivable. When I came in, you were collecting 99.75% of everything. I got it down to 99.9. .9. I got it down to a, a tenth of a percent of in-house loss, and we collected half of that by placing it with Lions and Associates. Oh, well, that's that's a hell of a sales pitch, you know, bringing bringing in that extra revenue. Because how much how much is it going to cost a company to generate that much revenue? I'm glad you're bringing that up because I have one of those kind of right now on the back burner. So th this kind of is helpful to me about that. What are you running into with it? Well, I have a lady that I need to contact who is doing collection. She does collections in-house, a corporate level. Okay. And so I, I knew I was going to have to really brush up on some of this before I even talk to her. Okay. And what what is what is she telling you? Do, do they use an agency at all? Uh, actually, I've talked to the subsidiaries. There were several of them on my list to call, and they all led to this one lady who does it in house on uh, for a corporation. So I'm I knew that I needed more seasoning before I talked to her, but I, I have her name and number. Okay. And what you're telling me is really helpful right now, you know. Awesome. Awesome. And I have I have a flyer on this called Profit Loss, Bad Debt and Sales. I remember it, reading it. Yeah, it's been yeah, it it's could more be, helpful for you to go over it. Right. And it should be in your sales documents in the CRM system to where you can just view it online or download it. And it's also something I posted to the blog on our website a couple of months ago. Um, don't look for too, too much information on our blog because my time to post to the blog is very limited. But every once in a while I'll go in there and post something and um, whatever I post will be helpful in some way, shape, or form. Um, what, 
what you'll want to find out um, once once we get off of off of uh, our, our Google Hangout. What, what, what we want to do is maybe look into that company and see what they do on annual sale. And once we determine what that company does in annual sales, you can ask that credit manager that handles everything in-house, what percentage of your annual sales are you writing off? You know, what did, what did you write off in 2013? And if they're a public company, I can find that information out from the Securities and Exchange Commission on their annual report. Um, if they're a private company, well, we have to ask them. If they're a large company, it's probably somewhere between a quarter of a percent and a tenth of a percent, which, depending on their annual sales, even even a company that only does, let's say they do $55 million in in annual sales, Fifty-five million with a quarter of a percent write-offs. If they collect ninety-nine point seven five, they've left one hundred thirty-seven thousand on the table that that year. And what that means for you is one hundred thirty-seven thousand in collection placements, which is about ten thousand, a little over ten thousand dollars worth of accounts from that client for a month. So it. It's, it's something you know that can be added into your pipeline and generate a little fee, and it all ends up. Um, what are what are some other things you're you're running into, Lori? Well, um, some of, some of like yesterday, I had a really bad day with just going through and just not being able to make contact. I had a lot of answering machines, a lot of bad numbers. Um, but then I started going back through some of my prospects that I had trying to, you know, get back and make sure they had gotten my information and stuff. Um, and I know we discussed that um, before. I'm trying to become more aggressive when I do get them on the phone, but I just, <laughs> I'm having issue as far as, I haven't met anybody on the phone that I felt like I could close that first time, so I need some work with one call closing. Okay. And I really do. And this is totally out of my experience of sales closing on a, on a on a meeting like this. So in a way I almost feel like my sales experience is it is just totally different than this. Okay. Well the the good thing in this is your sales experience may be different than what we do here, but this, what we do here, isn't necessarily a one call close. Um, you can close a client to get business in one phone call, but it's 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 not going to happen often. What you want to do is is get in there, and if if you can qualify them and begin to gather the information. You can begin to build a rapport with that client or, or potential client, and that's that's what will get you in the door eventually. Some of these companies, if you're dealing with larger companies, some of these guys are going to take six months to close. If they're a big company, they're not just going to get in there and, and close them. Um, on on smaller companies. A lot of times they'll have a, a couple of accounts sitting there that they can send them to you right now. But when you're when you're dealing with larger size companies, you're absolutely going to run into situations where you're going to have to talk to them ten times before they dump the business on you. But the thing with large companies is when they do dump it on you, it's a lot of business and. As as a company, we can realize a, a decent profit off of it, and and you as an account executive can realize nice commissions off of it when when you have a dump of business. Uh, I have I have several clients that have that have dumped hundred, two hundred, three hundred at a time, 
in business and when you begin, when our, when our collectors begin to go in and start collecting that money, whenever we get money in the house, that's the, that's the cash register ringing for you. What, um, Kim, what are some, Kim, are you there? Yes. All right. <laughs> Happy I'm to here. Yeah. What I what are you running into right now? Actually, that last question was very pertinent to me as well. I really appreciated that. And um, I'm not sure who asked that one, but that was really yeah. helpful. And your answer was very, very helpful. No. That was basically not knowing what to uh, the expectation is, um, like how quickly you're supposed to be able to get something to happen with a specific company. And, and, and the point in this is we... We want, we want to try to, uh, to close the deal as, as soon as possible, but the fact remains that sometimes we do have to build a rapport. Some companies are just going to say, hey, here's an account, thank you, and some of them are. So there's, there's definitely an importance in building that rapport and building a relationship because keep in mind we're going to be continually dealing with any clients you write because they're not going to have just a one-time need in this they're going to have a continued need for our services whether it's on a monthly basis a weekly basis a bi-monthly basis a quarterly basis it can vary from client to client depending on their size um, for example, um, Rick, Rick, has, Rick has a client that, Hello. that does nitrogen as fertilizers. Um, and right. what, that, what that means is they keep the two of the golf courses green. Oh, okay. Ryan, can you mute yourself? He did. Ah, okay. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> okay, uh, Mike, uh, one of the things that uh, I thought I might address here is that it would seem from the original question, uh, you know, it was expressed that, you know, in their experience that uh, they weren't closing with the first meeting. But I think, uh, you know, we keep in mind that uh, we, we actually are wanting to close that the same day. We were actually wanting to close it with one phone call uh, every time that we don't have to. I think that would be probably a more accurate description of what we're trying to accomplish. We really want to close that sale right then. Uh, the, the objections that we're getting and the uh, overcoming that we're being trained to do is actually close right then, right now. So. Yes, we may have to go back, and there may be some follow-up, but I think it's more accurately stated that we are trying to close right then, right now, the same phone call, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. You, you want to get in there and close the deal as soon as possible, okay? But the, the, re the reason I'm explaining that we don't necessarily have a one call close is because it doesn't happen that way all the time. Yes, absolutely make the effort to get it closed as quickly as possible. Use, use the rebuttals that are in our manual to overcome objections. But in, in the same sense, we're, we're not going, we're not going to always close things in the first call. So just... I was going to add one other point to that. Always keep in mind that uh, if you feel like you have, you're close to a close, you feel like there's really, you know, uh, an opportunity to close that day, uh, you know, I would say within the hour, make sure you contact either uh, you know, your mentor or Mike uh, to help you facilitate because they're they they will probably have tools in their toolbox that uh, that we could close that 
ASAP because one thing I found is the, the more time goes by and the more people get involved in the, the pot where they bounce things off of people in their company is a much better chance to lose that particular sale and closing it. You may be able to come behind later and get it, but it's never better to, or I should say there's nothing better than to love the one you're with and to find every way possible to close it either that within that same hour or two or that same day. It's, I would say that's pretty important. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely important. It's absolutely important. Um, one, one, of the, uh, one of the things that's, that's really important is qualify as soon as you can. Amen. And, and the, 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 reason, the reason for that is so we know whether, whether it's, it's real or Memorex. I, I, I'm sure some people on here remember those commercials. Is it real or is it Memorex? <laughs> yeah. How many glasses have you broke, Mike? How many mouses? How many glasses have you broke? With that stellar voice. Oh, glasses? Uh, none. None with music. <laughs> I, I have never had my music loud enough to break a glass. Well, your ears thank you for that. Um, I have another question. Okay. Um, can, you, can you talk more about the reasons why? credit managers and AR people and such, why they resist placing accounts. I think understanding that better helps me better understand what I'm trying to get past, you know? Well, a lot of times you're going to run into credit managers who are going to say, oh, well, we, we collect everything in-house. And I, I'm, I, I'm guessing that's that's kind of what, what this is leading into. Um, am I right on that, Kim? Um, well, yes, in part. Some people who say we collect everything in-house and some people who are just resistant overall, and they don't say they collect everything in-house, but they're not admitting that they've had a bad experience with collections necessarily. So it kind of makes me wonder uh, why they would hold back. I mean, that's one position that I haven't been in it is to be in that type of a company and so from my perspective I think why wouldn't they want it collected I, I don't quite understand the dynamics of maybe how it how they think it might make them look or what the situation is there okay um, there were a few key points in there um, one a credit manager does not always see us as an extension of their credit department. Some credit managers actually see an agency as a threat because they couldn't collect the money and we can. And it's it's two totally different animals. Two totally different animals. An in-house department collecting in a first party capacity and a collection agency like ours doing it in a third party capacity is two different animals. <coughs> there this this explanation is going to break off into two separate points. The first point being um, a lot of the agencies out there are going to do the exact same thing that that credit manager is doing to collect their debts. Meaning they're only going to make telephone calls and send letters, send the debt or an email. And these days, a lot of that stuff is automated, which if you if you look up industry reports and you can Google collection agency industry reports and some type of report will definitely come up that, that you can pull up in a PDF and read and see what the actual average yields are across the board on agencies in the U.S. Most of them underperform. The actual, the actual averages from the reports I've read recently fall between 11.7% recovery yields and 15%. Okay, and what that means is on a 15% recovery yield, that means if a client dumps a book of accounts 
worth two hundred thousand dollars on an agency that averages a fifteen percent yield, they're only going to collect thirty thousand dollars. That's that's what the yields mean, um, and that's one of the things that is going to stop a credit manager from placing accounts because when they have an agency that underperforms, it's just not worth it most of the time. Instead of having them deal with that agency that underperforms, a lot of times it's easier for them to just write it off. Now, there are a few agencies out there that still use a low-tech approach and still use old-school tactics to collect that. We're one of them. These are the agencies that truly perform. For, for example, right now, we're, we're collecting about 47% of everything that's placed with us. Okay, and that's, that's enormous when you compare it to the industry averages. Um, I might offer a perspective here, Mike. Um, imagine, if you will, um, he just used the term 47% and maybe to some who are relatively new to the collection business, like I am, you know, that might not mean a whole lot, but imagine, you know, that person that you're calling and talking to is sitting there for at least eight hours a day, day in and day out, five days a week, and their job security is maintaining uh, certain quotas based on whatever their 30, you know, I just gave a description of all that a few minutes back, but the bottom line is these um, AR managers are not as knowledgeable as CFOs are, but these AR managers are wise enough to know that we're coming in as a master gunfighter. We're coming in, and we're gonna. We're telling them our one of our greatest uh, options that makes us better than other companies is that we send people in person. We collect much faster, but they're also wise enough to know we're not working by the hour like they are five days a week, sitting in that chair, growing like a mushroom. You know, we're out there and we're making phone calls and we're getting paid on commission. <laughs> we get paid a lot more, and we get we make it a lot faster. So. Please understand that this is in their psyche, and what what they you know CFOs now some CFOs do get commission, some CFOs get a bonus at the end of the year, so they get paid a little better. But a CFO is a lot more concerned about those numbers on on the different 30, 60, 90, and and, and things that get past that point. They're a lot more important to the CFO than 90 percent of the people we talk to, the AR managers, and they know. They know that uh, collection agencies work on a nice big fat commission, <laughs> so it's it's very offending to them, you know. That there there's things that you're overcoming that you probably didn't have that perspective on. But please, you know, Mike's training us and training everybody to become like he's learned over a period of years how to be a master gunfighter and get in there. And it's a lot of phone calling, a lot of effort, but at the end of the day. You're, you're, that one bullet that you fired and, and it hit the mark, well, by golly, that, that's, that's going to get the job done and you're going to make a good commission out of it. And not only that, residual commission if you do your follow-up properly and the uh, other things that we're learning to do. That's the perspective I would have to offer there. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's one of the things about, about old school, old school collections. Some people, when they hear old school collection techniques, they immediately think that we have collectors that are just beating on debtors, calling them and screaming them and belittling them, degrading them. That's not old school collection. That's stupidity collection. Um, the way to successfully collect from a company is to put pressure on that company from every angle available and and you use it strategically just like Rodney was talking about being a master gunfighter okay when 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 you go to a gunfight well if it's if it's a situation where it's just a standoff and it's two guys gunfighting well 
you you've got to you got to shoot that one first. If you're in a gunfight situation where you've got several people shooting at you, you've got to pick off the one that's getting closest to you first. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and that's that's strategy. That's strategy. You also you also have to save some ammunition, and there, there's a reason I'm piggybacking off of Rodney's gunfight speech because it, it, it makes a very good point. The, our, our collectors are going to save some ammunition. They're going to put pressure in one place and see if it affects collection. Then they're going to put pressure in another place, see if it affects collection. And the collector's job is to know that industry and what points of pressure he or she can put on to that debtor company to affect payment. And the main thing is we're going after companies here, so they have revenue coming in. So what we need to do is make our clients' debt more important than the other debts that are sitting on their desk, and we do that by applying more pressure than the other guy. And it's just like the gunfight. If, if they're the gunfighter, if, if we look at that debtor as the gunfighter, and we're getting the closest, we're putting the most pressure, he's going to pick us off first. And he picks us off by writing a check, by sending us the money. Um, also, this is a technique that can be used in sales. Don't give all your ammunition up at one time. When you're discussing that's with a client, use use your various tools, your various information to get to get different responses from them. Um, you'll want to ask different questions. You know, and a lot of those questions are going to be qualifying questions. You know, the uh, the how much, the how old, and, and and how often, and all of that. But um, for for the most part, if you throw all of all of your ammo out about one time, and you don't close, well, then you have nothing left. If you come in and you build a relationship. And you get in there if you're unable to close it in one call. Or building that report, and you're going to get in there and and get the accounts. Um, Rick, what are some what are some of the things that that you run into? You you you've been around here for a good little while and uh, have run into a lot of things with a lot of clients. What is what is your most common obstacle? No, oh, we do they do in house collections. Okay. And which industry really? So the the California stuff you run into a lot of uh, you know the construction you'll run into. Well, we we pre lean all of our jobs, and that was one of the rebuttals we we just recently covered. You know how to kind of get around that. You know, there's some of them slipping through the cracks and things like that. Okay. But let me ask you a question on liens, Rick. Do liens collect debt? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> Do twenty four seven. They uh, they pre lien everything. And how many accounts have we gotten from them? Eighty eighty six. Something like that. We 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 we've done a good job. Out of that, uh, out of their business, and you know we we've done well with it, and we've recovered a lot of money for them as a client, and they are absolutely happy with us. And and guys, just so you know, the company that Rick is talking about, it, and 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 guys, when we're talking about clients, let's not mention their names on here because this is actually a live broadcast we're doing right now, so. We we don't want to bring anybody's names in that we don't have permission to. Um, right. This particular client, and if if any of you ever need a reference to close a prospect that has been wronged by another agency, this particular client that Rick's talking about that has placed eighty something, maybe ninety accounts with us since December. Okay. 
So they, they've been sending a lot of business. The last three agencies that they did business with, the last three, took their money. They collected it and took it. Now, these agencies are in California. California doesn't require that you be licensed. They don't require you to be bonded. Um, and and that's, that's why there are agencies that pop up in California that can do that and get away with it. Um, for example, where I'm at in Louisiana, if you do that, they put you in jail, and of course, your bond will pay will pay the clients that erode the money, and then when you get out of jail, the bonding company comes out. That's how that works. <laughs> put you in jail too. <laughs> Can I ask a question, please? A lot, of, a lot of states are like that, but the the fact is, on this particular client, we are we're in litigation against one of the agencies. We've already collected from the second one, and the third one, we, we, we have a judgment on it, and it's probably going to end up being an uncollectible judgment. We're trying to find some assets to attach, but they're a collection agency. They know how to move assets, and all that. So that's what they're doing. They're playing the game. But the point is, the point is, we've, we've helped them overcome that obstacle, of having agencies that were no good. Yeah, and one of the uh, overcoming objections, you know, that you can answer when they say we do it in house, uh, which is probably the predominance of the objection. The number that's probably the number one objection you're going to get. Um, I, I would, I always turn it around real quickly and. One thing you can do, you want to, when an AR manager, if you're talking with an AR manager, they have a than a CFO. If this is a big company, uh, one of the things I want to point out, you correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, you got to handle the smaller companies a little bit differently from the bigger companies. The bigger companies, the AR guy can, let, he will try to mask things, hide things, he will kind of, you know, modulate things and, and quite often can cause a company to really get into trouble. Whereas a CFO is going to watch, that's the very thing the CFO watches out for because an AR manager can put you in hurt real quick because they're protecting their job and they're not, you know. So when you get that 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 uh, that objection, what I quickly do is, you know, I say, well, uh, that's all right. I'd like, you know, I'll, I'll I'll call back and talk to your CFO about that. But you know, where I'm at today is that, you know, we we do you have anything that. Uh, you know, is, is uh, cause you to get nervous or might be making your margins move and getting you in trouble, you know, with your boss. I said, well, you know, we try to make you look like a hero and if there's anything we can do. But the main thing is you want to try and power past that objection and get them talking to you. That's one of the things I don't think we're, we should probably address a little bit, you know, just really kind of get past the objection. There. That's, they come up with something right off the bat every time, but we want to get past that and find ways to creatively go around it and keep the conversation going forward. And, and uh, one of the things that I do uh, to accomplish that is, is when they say, okay, uh, you know, we do it in-house, I say, well, that's great. You know, I appreciate that. It means you're probably doing a pretty good job. But, uh, that on it, you know, uh, is there anything sitting out there that, you know, maybe, uh, you know, you've written off or whatever, I take them in another direction. And, and you know, if you've written that off, uh, you know, maybe you want to take a second look at it. No? Okay. Well, that's all right. Well, I, like I said, I'm going to call back and talk to the CFO anyway. Don't be afraid to throw a barb like that out there because nine times out of ten, I've had a conversation with an AR manager, and I go back and I actually do follow up and talk to the, you know, CFO sometimes, and he has a completely different look at that. So don't just give up there at that point. If, if, uh, if they talk in any way, give you a hint that they got some business there, that they're not really managing in house. Don't be afraid to challenge it. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, when 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 I did sales in this, whenever I ran into someone that that told me they collect everything in house, you know, that I never ever took that at face value. Okay, because 
a lot of times when that comes over as as an objection, um, that that credit manager or AR manager, they're going to feel that if you believe that that he or she collects everything in house, you'll think there's no need for our services, and you'll get off of this phone. Okay. Um, what what I I always did is I, I compliment them on collecting their accounts in house. Okay, give give them some props because collecting a lot of your accounts in house, getting that in order, that is not an easy task. <laughs> these credit managers work their behinds on to get these accounts collected. Okay, and and they don't they don't work on commission like we do. So they get accounts collected, you know, they're still getting the same old salary, but they're still working their behinds off. Okay? So, you know, you you, you want to give them a, a kind of kind of like a prop up, you know, hey. You know, that's and, and of course be sincere. <laughs> I, I I know sometimes when I'm saying something I may sound like uh, I'm being condescending or something, but I, I'm I'm really not. Uh, you want to compliment them that they're collecting everything in house or almost everything in house, and what I what I'm going to do is go into qualifying questions and ask them. You know, on average, how many 90-day-plus accounts are you putting on your age? You know, because that's that's going that's going to determine what's available to be placed for collection, and what are their write-offs? And and I like I like everything that Rodney said, man. That that is absolutely important, and and absolutely. If if you're not getting the response that that you're looking for, you can go over their head. Absolutely, go over their head. Um, if we're not if we're not getting the business from them anyway, and you make them a little angry, so what? It's business. This is business, and and real business is not always a happy go lucky thing. You know, we're not we're not in there. Necessarily to to make them feel good. We're there to collect their money. Now, of course, to get in there, you have to be personable. You know, you have to make them smile. You have to give them the congratulatory. Um, sometimes, if if they're if they're doing a good job in collecting most of their stuff in house, you know, congratulations are in order because that's a difficult task. But we also want to find out what are they writing off each year? You know, what, what is the approximate amount of accounts that's sitting on their agency right now that have not paid according to the terms of the sale? Because if we can find that out, we can find find out what their placement potential is. We can find out we can find out you know what they have over ninety. We can find out how long they work them in their AR department because they're not going to work them forever. They're going to work it for ninety, hundred, twenty days, and they're going to consider it dead. And it's going in into the pile of write-offs. It's going going in the back. Got to go. Mike, what about those people that tell you they have insurance as well as a factoring company? What exactly do they mean? Because the guy didn't have he really didn't want to go into it with me but I did have one recently tell me that they use a factoring company and that he also has insurance on the side so if the factoring company doesn't cover it the insurance company does what kind of insurance is he talking about he's talking about um, accounts receivable insurance and that's a legitimate objection some prospects do contract with an insurance carrier to insure their accounts against delinquency okay and what that means is once the insurance premium is paid, if if the accounts that are insured become past due, the insurance will pay the balance on the account. Now, if this is done, it's going to depend on the insurance contract. Um, that's also going to determine 
when when the insurance company pays it to them, you know, whatever whatever's all in their insurance contract or their insurance declaration. You know how on your, your homeowner's policy you'll have or your car insurance policy you'll have a declaration page of what that insurance covers, what it pays out, what the deductible is, and and what your premiums are. That's that's what's going to tell them when when that when that account gets paid off. It might be at 60 days, might be at 90, might be at 120 days delinquency that they pay out. So and then uh, you know the, uh, the whole the whole idea with that liquidity, they maintain that liquidity so that uh, their their credit line stays at a certain level so they can meet payroll every week. And that business continues to function regardless of whether the debts are paid or not. That's the main purpose, I believe, of that insurance. So if they can meet, they will have their liquidity for you know weekly business, regardless of how that line fluctuates. And then when they use the factoring company, guess what? The factoring company does most of the work, but the factoring company turn around and use third-party collectors like us to finally get the job done for the ones that are tough to pay anyway. So. It still feeds us, right? Absolutely, good, very good point, Rodney. Um, that's that's something we can get into in a minute as well. Uh, but to to further elaborate on account receivable insurance, you what you would need to find out is what portion of their receivables are insured. Are they insuring everything, and and also. Why would they use factoring and insurance? It doesn't make sense to pay an insurance company for your receivables and a factoring company unless they're only insuring the, the portion of the receivables that gets charged back by the factoring company, which is going to bring me in to my next explanation about how factoring works. Okay, factoring is something that that generally occurs with manufacturing companies that um, that well manufacture things. A lot of times, it'll be heavy equipment, you know, farm implements, transportation equipment, stuff like that, in order to improve their cash flow. So they can manufacture more inventories. Uh, what um, uh, another another type of um, company that does a lot of factoring is the garment industry. You know, like, like clothes uh, or transportation. Is another one, transportation carriers will use factors so they don't have to wait for their brokers to pay them. Now, either either some of their stuff is going to be factored, or all of it is going to be factored. But the main the main thing that you want to find out on factoring is if that that business is done by recourse or non recourse. What recourse means is if that account. Gets to be 90 days old, and that factor has not collected the money. They're going to charge that account back to their customer, which is the potential client. Um, if their if their paper is recourse, if we ask them, what do you do with the accounts after the recourse they want to charge it back? Um, if it's if it's non-recourse paper, which you're not going to find a lot of non-recourse paper, non-recourse paper is just me that the factoring company takes the hit. Okay, so on 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 that point, the prospects company no longer has any liability on the account. And now belongs to the factoring company. So, so that's that's not that's that's something that 
we would actually ask them, well, who factors your paper? And we call the factoring company and see if we can get business from them. Um, but even even if they tell you, hey, I factor my stuff, I I insure my receivables, whatever the case is, they still have some element of loss. There is there is no way for a company, unless they're a really small company, to to completely do away with all loss from bad debt. It's not possible. They're going to have some type of loss. Um, do you have, Lori? Do you have additional questions about factoring and um, insured receivables? No, I, th I think you just answered them. I just, I was surprised. I didn't realize there was insurance that could handle that. So when, oh yeah, there's there's insurance for everything. <laughs> get anything insured. Any, anything an insurance company can collect a premium from you on, they're going to provide the service. They're going to look at the risk factors and say, how much money can we make off of this? And and that's, you know, that's, that's another thing. If the accounts are insured, the insurance company has to be making the money off of it. If they're losing money on it, guess what's going to happen to that prospect? They're going to get dropped. Or, or the other the, the alternative is to raise their premiums so they can so they can offset their loss. Um, I, I have a question. Yeah, do, do they raise their rates if something happens? You know, it's kind of like a car. If you if you get in a car wreck where your rates get raised up, does, does the insurance companies do the same thing with that? Well, sure. Absolutely. Greater the risk, the higher the premium. That's it. That's it, man. Any any time you have an insurance claim, your premiums go. Okay. Because when you have a claim, it increases the risk that the insurance company takes insuring that entity. Okay. So yeah, a absolutely. And you know, insuring receivables, you may also want to find out. Well, if you have them insured, you know how how cost effective is it? Would collections be more cost effective? And in some cases, it won't be. In some cases, it will be. But most of the time, you're not going to run it. A whole lot um, of insured receivables. And, and I have another question. I don't know. I don't know if I should wait until the end of it. It's regarding uh, other outside marketing. You know, other than just being on the phone, like having business cards, using a Facebook page, stuff like that. Um, I would say set up a LinkedIn page. Set up a LinkedIn profile, and we have we have in our in our training cloud, and also in the sales docs in the CRM system. There's there's a a, a PDF like a little ebook on setting up your your LinkedIn profile for maximum exposure. Okay, uh, thank you. And. But for, for the most part, though, this is going to be done by getting on the phone and getting people to talk to you. You can bring you can bring some some prospects in off of social media, but they're not going to be. It, it won't be a lot of them. Okay, so business cards, like if you're handing out business cards at, at, to business owners and stuff like that, just. Maybe the trade shows, trade shows, stuff like that. Trade shows, absolutely. If if you have trade shows locally that you want to attend, and it's it's industries that that sell to other business uh, other businesses, then absolutely. You know, obviously, if it's if it's a uh, 
if it's a uh, doctors and nurses convention, um, you, you may pick up a couple of medical supply places, but obviously you don't want to go and ask the uh, private practice doctors, hey, you got any medical bills to place with us? <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they have, like, um, you know, there's probably builders, trade shows and stuff like that, construction companies, you know, where they hang, would hang out together. Architects, I know they have places, designers and stuff, architect firms. And... Yeah, a absolutely. Um, you know, I, I, I know I know a guy who's really successful in this that handles strictly automotive aftermarket clients. And um, he goes, he'll, he'll go to the different um, the different trade shows, and uh, he'll he'll meet you know additional prospects that can place business with them. And he's been doing this for so long that half of the ones that are at these trade shows, he already does business with them. So you know he can. Uh, he's talking to one guy, and he says, "Look, man, you know you, you want a reference? Look, come down here to, to Bob's booth and." And ask Bob how we do for him, and that's that. That's a wonderful selling tool. Once once you get into it, um, uh, of course, most of your stuff is going to be done by phone. But uh, trade shows is another avenue. Some guys, some guys and gals will will go to these to obtain additional prospects. Uh, Travis, Travis, what you got going on, man? Haven't heard from you yet. Well, uh, everything pretty much. It's just getting the standard, uh, the standard comebacks as in we do it in house stuff like that. So for me, it's more or less finding the hot button or qualifying them, and literally like sitting on the hot button. Till they get to till they move. That's it. That's it. Get on the hot button, man. That hot button's hot. That's why they call it a hot button. There we go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And and collect collecting everything in house is fine if they're within their acceptable loss, but there's always more money that they can be collecting. And and the bottom line is, if we collect a bunch of their money that they would have normally just written off, that that credit manager that placed the accounts with you looks like a superstar for finding an agency like us that's as successful as we are in collecting the money. Because guys, look around. Look around at other agencies that are out there. Most of them are not effective. Most of them have low yield. And, and, and Rick, Rick, will, Rick will tell you how successful we've been for his clients. Rick's, Rick's, Rick's got a little, little book of clients going on over there that, uh, that we do really well for. And uh, Matter of fact, I, I know I know there's one of them that you should be seeing a nice dump of business from now that now that we're getting a little further into the hot weather. Yeah, it's their it's their peak season right now. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's. That's some good stuff. Sometimes, sometimes these uh, these companies have seasonal debt. Like uh, a few months ago, I talked to the, the national director of credit for this uh, this company that makes windows that goes into RVs, and she said, "Call me back and uh, call me back in the fall around September October." She said, "That's when we incur most of our debt." So you know, I put her follow up for you know. For that time, and she said, "You know, I'll just send the business straight over to you." That's it. That's it. Calendar up for September, and uh, let's get the business and get the client their money, make them happy, and put a couple bucks in our pocket along the way. That's 
that's and why. that's why that, that's why it's so important to make so many calls per day because you never know who you're going to run into. You never know what they have sitting there, you know, and, and every every company's potential client. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Ron, Reiner, what, yes, what, sir. Do, what do you have? What do you have going on, man? What are some of the things that that you're running into? Well, uh, I have a deal that will probably come to fruition tomorrow. Uh, I called the gal yesterday and she said that uh, she had used two credit collection companies and had bad luck with them. And I said, well, if you had a bad stake, do you quit even stake forever? And she said, no. And I said, well, give me a try. You know, so uh, she told me that she placed collections with one company and they ended up going out of business and not doing anything for them. And then the second company, they had to prepay for the placement and uh, they sent out collection letters, a couple phone calls they actually collected and never turned over the money to them. And uh, so she had talked to the CEO to get permission to place that with me tomorrow and I, I'd be following up. I think one of the things, Mike, um, since I've been in sales many years, closing is closing regardless, whether it's over the phone or in person. You have to make sure that your conversation is moving forward and that you're getting the yeses where you need to. And the longer a person's on the phone with you, it gives you more reason to ask them more questions. And when somebody gives you an, um, an obstacle or an objection, repeat it back because sometimes they'll realize how stupid the objection is. And uh, you know, there's two sales to be made at every presentation. Either we're buying their story or they're buying ours. And uh, like you say, I like to compliment them if they say they're doing it in-house. And I come back and say, how's that working for you? You know? And then when they tell me, I say, now, are you just telling me that just to be telling me that? Or is that true? And uh, then they start questioning. And I get a little more deeper into conversation. But if you realize the average person has to be asked to buy six times before they'll make a decision to go with you, regardless whether it's over the phone or face to face. That's the reason why we have to have follow ups to be able to get deeper into conversation, set that rapport with the customer and be able to win them over. Absolutely. And and you see you see what Reiner is talking about. It it prompts you to listen for ideas, okay. When, when you're when you're asking them questions, they're going to tell you what you need to do to close them. Now, it doesn't mean you're act, absolutely going to close them, but if you've ever heard the term "read between the lines," well, we have we have to listen between the lines when we're on the phone, and you know sometimes sometimes that means paying close attention sometimes it means taking simple notes and 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 sometimes you can actually persuade by listening and and what I what I mean by that is for for example when you're listening to a speaker like on a, on a, on a platform you have to listen to his entire presentation without any personal involvement because he's, he's up there making a speech. He doesn't need you. But you as an inside salesperson, you have, you have to listen to very short speeches. Perhaps sometimes they're only a few seconds in, in, in length, but when, when you're listening, you're, you're drawing that prospect out to get more information. Okay, it, it's part of engagement. Okay, when you're listening to what they're saying, you can begin selling through questions. Um, questions are absolutely among the best tools in your selling toolbox. Okay, because they bring the needs of your prospect out to the table. 
they also they also bring out the concerns of your prospects. Okay, so you absolutely have their needs and their concerns, their prejudices. Get them out out in the open, so the right decision will be obvious. Uh, a, a lot of times, one, one, of, one of the things I find myself doing a lot, and I have to actually stop myself from doing it, is talking too much. And I, I know I'm posting this presentation, so yes, I have to talk a lot. But sometimes, sometimes I find if I'm on the phone selling somebody, I'll over talk and end up over selling and lose the deal. Yeah, you got to be a better listener than a talker. Uh, absolutely, and, and you know the questions. The questions are always going to be the what, the when, the where, the why, the how, and the who. You know, news reporters, the five W's. You know, <laughs> right. And that's what we're doing. We're investigating that prospect in their business whether we're going to line up, you know, we're investigating. So you have the right to ask the questions. But I think, Mike, one of the uh, things that I've talked with Rick about is the opportunity that we have here is, uh, you know, we're all doing the same job in trying to secure additional accounts. But we have to take the mindset. We have a business, and I share this with uh, Edward. We have a business, and we have to make sure that when we're talking to a prospect, that it makes sense in what we're asking. So you know, we're not you're not asking us to pay a franchise fee. You're not asking us to pay anything. You're providing us leads. You're providing us a website. So you really have to get serious in your mindset and say, "This is my business." When you're on the phone and working from home, this is your business in association with with Lions and Associates. So you got to get serious about it, and you know. Uh, you can stand on the street corners and hand out pencils or $100 bills, and not everybody's going to take them. And uh, you got to be serious, and, and it doesn't make sense in what you're asking. If somebody says no, are you just going to tuck your tail and run? Or are you going to stand up and say, hey, I have something of value here. And uh, maybe you need to practice, and I encourage you to practice. And, you know, call Rick or call, call anybody and say, does this make sense? Sometimes you may think that you're effective over the phone and your questioning is poor or you're not hanging in there long enough to overcome the objection. And, uh, you know, that's where you just got to get a backbone and now come with experience, reading books, and also watching some YouTube videos on telephone selling. You know, uh, you got to get serious. I mean, we have a great opportunity here. It's not costing us any money except for an investment of our time. Mike even provides leads. How, how would you like to go through and select your own category of businesses uh, on YouTube or Google and uh, try to call these businesses? Very time consuming. You wouldn't get hardly any calls in, I can assure you. Hey, so that, thank you for that, Mike. That's, that's, how, that's actually how this used to be done. When I, when I started in this industry in the 90s in sales, you had to find your own prospects, you know, and you, you had, they had a business directory that you could call from, but, you know, you, you, had, you had to look them up, you had to call them, and what I, what I have is kind of similar to, to, to having a directory in front of you, but, I mean, these days, some companies do still tell you to go out and find your own leads. And, and 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 the thing is here, if if we can if we can help each other out, we can we can get up we can help each other get up this green arrow right here, and and that way that way we don't have to call out the grumpy cat, right? Right? The grumpy cat. Anybody ever <laughs> seen Grumpy Cat? <laughs> <laughs> something to a prospect, we can absolutely ask them, hey, 
what is your opinion on this? You know, for for example, you're calling you're calling the trucking industry most 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 of our guys are calling primarily trucking right now because of the things that that have taken place between brokers, carriers, and the federal government forcing them to increase their bond deposit. Uh, you can you can ask the carriers that you're calling, you know, what is your opinion? What is what is your opinion on the stuff that's going on with the uh, with the carriers, I mean, with the brokers. What is your opinion on that? Do you consider this a problem? Has it caused any brokers to go out of business on you? Or has this ever happened to you? And I, I, I can assure you, if you ask a trucking carrier if they've ever had a broker not pay them, they're going to say yes every time. If they don't say yes, they haven't had many moments broken. Okay? And, and when they tell you, when they tell you what their opinion is, tell them, based on, based on what you have told me, Mr. Prospect, it would seem that the solution would be, and of course the solution's going to be, hey, this broker took your money or went out of business, whatever happened, the solution would be to place the account for collection right now so we can get to work and collect your money. Rick, what are you what are you running into most often when you're talking to uh, to, to transportation carriers or trucking carriers specifically? As far as objections? Yeah. Uh, well, a lot of them like to fib and say, uh, you know, we don't have anything right now. We, uh, we're we not writing anything off. Or, you know, some of the smaller ones will say, well, we have, we just have a couple clients and they're slow payers, but they're big and we can't really afford to lose them as a customer. So we don't put out collections on them. Right. Now, are, are you asking these guys if they have brokers that have, not yeah. Good. I'll say you got any broken you know your money, you know. Talk about the uh, the bond limit being raised to seventy five thousand. Right. And you know that uh, a seventy five thousand dollar bond only cost a lot of money if that broker was already shady and doesn't have his ducks in a row. It could cost them up to 15% of, of that amount. And, you know, if, if, if you're somebody that's got their ducks in a row, a bond, a bond will cost you 1%, 1.5%, 2%. For example, I, I pay 1.5% for bonds. So my bonds are expensive. But you, your guys out there who are brokers who have had claims on their bonds and their personal houses and in order, those guys paid an arm and leg to get bonded. And the ones who couldn't afford to do it, they either bought Peter to pay Paul, which created debt, or, or they just simply shut their doors, which also created debt. And guys, remember... Michael, can you repeat that? Because there's so much feedback, it was hard to hear what the last couple sentences you said. Okay. If if a broker has has either robbed Peter to pay Paul because of their their bond increase, it creates debt. If a broker has just simply shut their doors, it creates debt. And we're talking specifically about transportation brokers there, not any other type of broker, uh, strictly in transportation. Okay, now, if you run into trucking carriers that tell you the broker went out of business on it, Rick, can we still collect that money? Sure can. 
Have you seen this money get collected? Sure have. Have we even got paid? Have we even What's that? collected? It? Have we even collected it behind other agencies that specialize in trucking paper? Oh yeah. <laughs> hey, we've taken clients from a few of them. We don't want to mention any names, though. No, we definitely don't want to mention any names. But the, the fact is, the guy who manages our collectors is an expert in transportation. I have a little bit of expertise, too. Not as much as Tom, but uh, he's been dealing with transportation paper in a third-party capacity for 30 four years. So he knows what to do with it. He knows what to teach the collectors. He knows what to teach them about laws. And he also knows how to collect from other parties when the broker is out of business. Which what that means for your clients or potential clients is if they place that account against a broker, sixty percent of the time we're going to collect it. All right, so what what else do we have in, as far as questions? What was that, Mike? What, what else do we have as far as questions go? I don't know about questions, but I think a good resource for everybody would be getting on the, uh, the databases but when they do run into the credit managers that don't want to talk or they're just completely shooting them down, they can go up the chain of command and maybe get a second opinion, like uh, going to A to Z and Reference USA and, and finding, uh, you know, the CFO or the, uh, you know, the controller. I think that'd be a good resource for everybody to use. Yeah, it, it would. Um it's a good resource on stuff that you've already identified that there's something there to be had from mm -hmm. us. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend putting in too much time when you're when you're just when you're just going. Right. Yeah, I was gonna say that I, I was gonna say a lot of times they send me to oh, I'm sorry to interrupt. No problem. Go ahead. Uh, a lot of times they send me to the corporate, and that uh, that kind of gets me because I, I just think, well, now I don't know if I should call the corporate office or if I should just leave it alone. I, usually I don't call. I was wondering if that was the right thing to do or not. Calling is oh. all the right thing to do. Always call. You don't call, you don't get the business. And, you know, sometimes you don't get the business if you do call, but if you don't call, you never get the business. If you do call, you might get the business. So if they tell you to call corporate, that means that they have enough accounts receivable for it to be centralized in one department. Okay. Uh, so, so definitely, if they say call corporate, give them a call. Yeah, and when you get a situation like that, be sure to ask them, can you help me? Do I need to call a corporate, get the name and phone number, and thank them for helping you? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. If, uh, if you can get the information, and, and also... Also, one of the things you do when you're talking to somebody, whether they're placing business with you or not, ask them for a referral. I know it's bold, but ask them. Ask them, hey, do you know anybody that needs us? Every once in a while, they say yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Hello. Hello. <laughs> All right. So, 
Good morning, Mitch Schreiner. Okay, I'm, 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 trying, I'm trying to mute. There we go. There's a mute. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, are you muted? you got to unmute when you come back. All right, so so what else What else do we have here for Greg? Any other questions before we close? Uh, hold on. Okay. I guess we're good. Hmm. Oh, I, I have a question for Reiner. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was wondering if his crew crew is full because I have a friend who's worked for ten years in sales, and uh, well, not not ten years in sales, ten years plus in sales. I don't know how many years. It's been quite a while, and uh, I just I mentioned to him that that uh, there may be a position to open if he's interested. And in, he hasn't got back to me, but I don't know if there is. So I. <laughs> Oh wait, Ryan, Reiner's muted, man. I mean, uh, Reiner, Reiner, you gotta unmute, man. I guess I can probably call him. I'll call him after the. Hey, give me a call after the hangouts, and then. Uh, yeah, we'll but I'm always hiring. Always. Okay. Someone asked in the group chat how um, what industry is best to start with. I think it was the lady on the left, Brittany, or something. Yes, and um, transportation is hot right now. We want to go. We want to go after as much of this stuff as we as we possibly can because it's it's really hot right now. So we want to get. We want to get as much of that as possible. Excellent. I when I've been calling transportation, something I've been I mean what's something I've been saying is is just pointing out that we have a division that specializes in transportation and try and really um, give that a little emphasis and that seems to get me a little more time on the phone. It kind of in my experience, it's caught people's ear a little, and um, so anyway, it's just something I've been trying. Okay. Well, it's a true statement. You're not lying. You're the specialist. You're the account executive. You specialize in trucking. Heck, I specialize <laughs> in whatever category I speak to. I become the authority. Right, and and the, the the fact of the matter is, as an agency, we absolutely know every industry we collect in like the back of our hands and it's, it's my job to know that it's my collection managers job to know that and it, it's both of our jobs to make sure that the collectors can can get into these industries effectively because collections isn't isn't one size fits all some companies seem to believe that it is and the ones that do Unfortunately for them, they have lower yields. Uh, it, it, it's something that has to be approached specific for for an industry. Uh, so, absolutely, We're, we are specialists. We are experts, and in, in, in addition to that, we are. The go-to guys or the go-to gals in whatever whatever industry. <laughs> Terry, you finally got your camera working, huh? <laughs> I'm learning. How about me? <laughs> yeah, your camera's working, Brittany. <laughs> oh. 
Live yeah. and clear. We don't we don't have we don't have Tim, we don't have Lori, and we don't have uh uh Edwin. Edward, Edward, not Edward. Well it's just because I'm having a bad hair day. No, no. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm having a bad hair day too. It all it, it just fell out. <laughs> you're having no, you're having no hair day, Mike. <laughs> I, I'm having no day. I like it like <laughs> And, and you, you know what's funny? I used to have really long hair, like a long time ago. <laughs> and I can I can still grow hair, but I just like it like this. <laughs> That's great. I prefer it. I, I go to a barber, and he, he keeps his hair really long because it's falling out. And it's just the back part of his head, though. <laughs> Oh. So we we call that a scully, you know. You know <laughs> the in the back and the bald on the top. That's a scully. Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. All this right. is very helpful. Thank you. Very. Good. Good. And if 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 you. <laughs> <laughs> If if you guys have some more questions, hey, I'm I, I've I've got my phone off while we're doing this, so I'm, I I I completely belong to everybody that's on here right now. So if if you've got something for me, I'm willing to spend as much of my time on this as uh, as you guys require. I just think it would help a lot, Michael, if I could if I could listen to someone actually go through the motions, closing with the person, everything. You, you know what I mean? And the, the whole sale. Well, the realistic uh, reality of that, if I could interject, would be you'll probably be able to hear an outstanding presentation, but they close, that's a long shot. Uh, that doesn't happen that often. Once in a while, it'll happen, but usually it'll be a two or three step process. I mean, Rick, he gets a lot of people every week that comes on that he's talked to over the last seven months. Hmm. So, That's you know, the reality of a, a call and a close, I don't want to sound negative, but it's highly unlikely. Right. But at least you can get the, the logistics of uh, how to start the presentation and how to uh, inquire, you know, who, who's your mentor? Rodney. Okay, well, what I would suggest to Rodney is uh, maybe what you two ought to do is get on a conference call and alternate calls where you make a call and he makes a call and do that back and forth. That's a very effective learning tool. Yeah, he said he was going to get with me today on a couple of things that I have. Well, give on. Rodney a chance. Give him a chance. I'm sure he's going to. Well, Rodney, Rodney's been great. It's just that, you know, getting, getting to hear actually the back and forth means yeah. a lot. Oh, mm -hmm. absolutely. I agree with you 100%. But uh, give him a chance to do that, and then the next time we do a hangout, you'll probably have some good uh, things to t talk about. All righty. Yeah, and I, I, I'd say I'd do it with you, but I'm, I'm absolutely a hammer when it comes to uh, <laughs> calling clients and selling them. And you, you, don't, you don't want to get into that habit until you have a lot of experience. And, and, and Rick. Rick, Rick can tell you some of the things I, I, I tell potential clients and close them because I've done a lot of conference calls with Rick. And, and I, when, when I go in, I, I am absolutely not afraid to put them on the spot to make them uncomfortable. And, and Rick will tell you I love making them uncomfortable. And that's, <laughs> That's that's the collector in me that comes out. I like to make him uncomfortable. It's fun. Well, he, cl he closed one guy and told him he's making a bad business decision. The guy's like, you know what? You're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was true. The guy was making poor business decisions, and typically you don't want right. to you don't want to point out, hey, you're a terrible businessman. But. Well, you have to do that with finesse, and that comes with your experience, Mike. I mean, 
years ago, I was able to razzle dazzle a new salesperson, and uh, they go, "How in the heck can you do that?" Well, it's it's skills, people skills, and uh, you know, uh, the more confident that each and every one of us becomes over the phone in acquiring new accounts, we get that much stronger. I mean, I'm sure Rick's a complete different account executive today than when he first started on the phone. Correct, Rick? Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, basically, yesterday he was strong. <laughs> well, I don't. I don't uh, concentrate too much on the presentation. I, I'm concentrating on getting those my questions answered, so I can go in, I identify the business, and ask the pertinent questions that that gets me in the door with them. Correct. Once you identify it, you know they're they're, they're a potential client. And Rick, Rick is getting really good at recognizing buying signals and and getting in there and getting getting the business to come to to come to fruition. Um, like for for me me for example, if if I if I'm on the phone with a prospect and they're telling me everything I want to hear, I have a problem closing now. If they're fighting me the whole way, I can close. <laughs> <laughs> That's so Some of your most difficult uh, clients that you've acquired, Mike, were probably the most difficult to deal with over the phone, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, but you know, it's 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 those difficult clients that teach us as salespeople and help us learn how to effectively close and how to how to handle a less than optimum situation which is going to be every phone call is going to be a less than optimum situation you know it's very rare that you go into a call and a credit manager says oh man I'm, I'm glad you called I was just looking for somebody to play some business with I've had that happen a few times <laughs> Yeah, it happens. It happens, but it doesn't happen often. Well, our one client, uh, I talked to her. I think she was a, a cold call. Uh, she said, well, send me your information in a collection agreement. So I sent it out, and I'm thinking, you know, well, she's probably just kind of pulling my chain here. And then, you know, a few, late, a few days later, she sent the contract back with the business. I was like, wow, that was easy. <laughs> Too bad they didn't all work that way. <laughs> right. I wish they did. That would be awesome. Yesterday was my third day, and uh, I had a lady, and she had two delinquent accounts that were current, and she had, I think she had one that was, like, really old or something. And uh, she said that she really I navigated through the site, and she really liked our site. She liked the idea that, she could uh, just log on and we we'd get 24/7 updates to her and stuff because the other client the other collection agency she used didn't have that but the last collection agency she used actually just sent one letter then charged her money so um, and then they never collected her money and so she she uh, she really liked what she was bought sold on it but then she said but her boss is friends with a lot of the clients so now she's the problem she has is she's got to make sure that when she places the accounts with us, um, that she runs it by her boss first, make sure he's not going to pull them back out because he's friends with the clients. So that's what I'm working with. That's oh. a poor business decision. <laughs> okay. Um, who, who is it? I want to be his friend. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe I can fly him down here to New Orleans, take him out to the French Quarter, get him drunk on hurricanes, and... He can bring his checkbook and and you know write me a check and uh, and we'll be friends. <laughs> You're an expensive friend, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you know, I, I actually um, I did a conference call with uh, with Juan who, who who was working for us who who was having some issues getting stuff closed and overcoming objections. And I, I looked in our our accounts, and I found a debtor 
that we've collected from that we had to really put pressure on. And, and this company, we almost caused them to lose their contractor's license. So they were definitely not happy with us. So I said, okay, I've got somebody who's going to be really difficult here. So me and Juan conference called him. And I used that so I could show him how how to deal with people that are fighting or placing business. And I didn't close the deal, but they had that same excuse. Oh, you know, well, well, we're friends with them. <laughs> and and I, I I told this credit manager, I said, really? I said, man, that's that's awesome. I said, well, check this out. I'm going to send you a plane ticket to come down to New Orleans this weekend. You and I are going to be friends. And all you need to do is write me a check for $50,000, and we're going to be buddies. I mean, the best of friends. We're going to, we're going to paint the town. Fantastic time. And we're going to be friends. Bring that checkbook. And, and she says, what? I said, well, you heard me. We're going to be friends. Come on. I said, these guys owe you 35000 I'm always saying, look, my friendship is better. I live in New Orleans. I can show you the good food and the good music. That's worth $15,000 more. Because <laughs> you're crazy. I said, I said, I know I'm crazy. I said, but who's letting a friend take them for $35,000? I said, hell. If that's the case, we need to be friends. I'll, I'll absolutely be your friend. Thirty-five, fifty thousand, no problem. Let's be friends. We'll be buddies. <laughs> you can text me, and I'll text back. You know, we can email back and forth. You know, from time to time, we'll be buddies. <laughs> and and the purpose of that was. To get this person out of a, out of her comfort zone, you know, she's saying, "Oh, well, you know, we place it, but they're friends." And and and, and look, if if I did if I did collection work for my friends and didn't make them pay me, I wouldn't be in business. Yeah. Well, that's a good example of how you kind of have to call people on what they're doing sometimes, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And this, this part of it is, is the aggressive part of selling. And I, I know some people here aggressive, and they're like, oh, well, I don't want to be aggressive, but let's... Let's look at a sports team, any sports team. Your aggressive players are on the field or on the court, and your non-aggressive players are on the bench. Same, same thing goes with sales. And, and aggressive doesn't always mean pushing the buttons. Aggressive means using the tools in your toolbox. Constantly yeah. in pursuit of the sale. Absolutely. All right, so we are we are definitely definitely running over time here, which is which is good. Which is good. I like this. Hopefully, hopefully, I've helped some people out here, and it'll produce some business. Very helpful. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Mike, I have one question. Okay. Uh, how, what's the protocol on collecting on bad collection companies that some of these uh, people we're calling on have experienced, where maybe they might have went out of business or they collected the some money but didn't turn it over to the account? Okay. If they have gone out of business, there's nothing we can do. Okay. So we can't pursue the owners of the business because it's deceased? Well, usually a collection agency is going to be a corporation or an LLC. Protected which, by the incorporation laws or the LLC. Right, which which is 
is not going to allow us to pursue the owner individually. Right. Um, also, one of the things we need to find out what were they were they bonded, you know, okay. and if if they were if they were bonded, which most of the if, if an agency is somebody that's going out of business, that means they're not doing things on the up and up. Chances are they're not bonded, but it's it's something that that we can find out. If they were bonded, we may be able to collect on the bond unless it was exhausted. Uh, Mike, don't, yeah. don't you want to have them, don't you want to have them check to see if the the bankruptcy or, or uh, was verified? Well, they they can they can do that, but you want to have the client do that themselves. Um, that's what I'm saying, but you ask them if they verified that the company was actually bankrupt, because sometimes they'll tell them they're bankrupt and they're lying to them. Yeah, this is this is true also. I've ran into that, into that a few times. How, how does someone know that they're verified? I mean, they, they actually saw the, the court results or something? Well, they would have received a bankruptcy notice. From from the U.S. bankruptcy court, um, if it was a, a Chapter Seven, which is a complete dissolution, it would have been just the bankruptcy notice. Um, if it was a Chapter Eleven, which is a reorganization, um, they would have received notice of the bankruptcy and notice from the trustee that's that's overseeing the repayment scheduling for the. For, for the uh, debtor and the bankruptcy court. In other words, when a uh, reorganization takes place, the court appoints a trustee to oversee everything. I, I wanted to share that I found a, a, class, a course on accounts receivable, if nobody's familiar with all the ins and outs of it, and it's at universalclass.com. It's a $40 course. Thank you. And they, they also have a persuasion course at there too for forty bucks. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Man, I, I I need to build a website like that and make it automated. I know, I know, Mike. You'd be great at this. I, I, I could collect a lot of forty bucks. Just have it automated where I don't have to actually do any work. Just build it. <laughs> My husband does that at his school. He works for a college. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, back to the bankruptcy thing. Um, so, what about? I know you've talked about it. we can, we can collect and tracking if a broker's gone bankrupt. But does that actually mean that there are just often other avenues through which to get the money? Or if someone has actually gone bankrupt, is there actually any way to collect from them? Is there a time limit or anything like that? Well, in Specifically in trucking, if it's a broker that went bankrupt, we're going to go after the consignee, mm -hmm. which is oh. the entity that received the goods. And if Section 7 is not signed on the bill of lading, we can go after the shipper as well. Um, I, I know that sounds kind of Greek to some of you here, but it's, it is not something you really need to worry about or even discuss with clients. Uh, because it's it's something the collectors do, um, but that's that's what we utilize to to collect those types of debts. Uh, brokers also have a bond, um, which we pursue their bond as well. So when when one of our collectors gets a piece of transportation paper, they begin knocking on doors, and. Basically, it's it's a matter of going in and playing everybody off of each other until somebody coughs up the money. Now, there there are some other industries that that we can collect in similar ways, even if they're bankrupt. Uh, construction in the western states, uh, California, Oregon, Washington. Nevada, um, Arizona, all have specific bonding laws for contractors where where they're bonded. But um, for for example, we just we just got a check from a surety company 
on a contract with that filed Chapter 7. This company went bankrupt, complete dissolution, and we still got our client paid. And it's because we went after the bond. We went after the surety, and we were able to prove that the surety was liable. So we got paid. Are, are the so time limits? Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, well, what happened a few days later? Their subsidiary called us up. Uh, can you guys uh, help me with this account? <laughs> that, that, was, that was on a different one, Rick. <laughs> but, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> what, what, what was your question, Kim? Oh, are are there any differences in as far as like the time limits when when a bankruptcy is involved? As far as you know, what what is too far to collect? Um, how, how old is too old? I mean. Um, it really depends. If you're looking at trucking paper, you don't want to go too much over a year. Okay. Okay. In, in uh, construction supply, you don't want to go over two years. And, and the reason being in construction supply, you don't want to go over two years because that's the statute of limitations for filing a claim on a bond. Okay. Um, in trucking, the reason you don't really want to go over a year is because when you start beating on the other doors, if it's more than a year old, it's going to be really hard to collect because these companies have to go back and and it, it's a ways back when you're when when you're bringing something that's just coming to their attention. It, it's something they have to go way back to find out what it is and. You know why? Why it ended up that way? That makes sense. Thank you for clarifying that. Right, and and most most companies, if they have something that's bankrupt, we don't want to mess with it. Okay, unless unless it's in transportation or it was actual construction supplies in the western states, um, we can we can definitely. We can definitely take a look at all of those. Uh, some of them will be collectible, but in, in other industries, there's there's simply not much not much recourse on our part to to be able to affect collections properly for that client. Mm -hmm. Got it. 